Thank you. Uh, yes, from Oregon. Has anybody here been to, been to Bend? You guys know where Bend, Oregon is? Little 80,000 person people town. Uh, I moved there about 20 years ago from Los Angeles, where I started my photography business. I've been a professional photographer about 25 years. Moved, uh, started in Los Angeles, moved to Bend, and thought, how am I going to have any business here? Went from LA to Bend, you know, at the time 30,000 people in this, and it was kind of like a farming town, so there really wasn't much going on. Um, this is what most people know my name for, Kubota. This is my tractor company. Just kidding, I don't have a tractor company. But when I moved to town, actually, you guys probably don't know about tractors, but out in the west, in the Midwest, there's tractors are huge. Kubota tractors are like John Deere tractors. And so when I first moved to Bend, I put my ad in the phone book, you know, for my photography business. And I remember within the first month or so, I started getting some calls. And one of the calls I, I love was I got a call, and uh, this guy, and I work with my wife. My wife, Claire, helps manage the business. And she, she does like the brainy stuff, you know, like she sets all the packages and pricing and all that. So I get this call and I answer the phone, which is a big mistake in the first place for me to answer the phone. And then the guy's like, hey, is this Kubota? I said, yes, sir, it is. You got that model XKE197 in stock? I'm like, hold on a second, sir. I'm like, Claire, do we have a new wedding package, XKE19 something or something? She's like, what are you talking about? I said, sir, I, uh, are you calling Kubota Photography? He's like, no, Kubota Tractors. I said, I said this is Kubota Photography. He goes, well, connect me to your tractor department. <laughs> totally true story. I'm like, uh, no. So I got like a few calls like, like that for the first couple of years in biz. Um, this is my, my actual building uh, in Little Bend. And uh, we occupy the upstairs and part of the downstairs here. We built this about six years ago. Uh, Entrance way, just to give a little background to what I do. A little bit of everything photography wise. So um, I have a whole, could talk about marketing and the reasons why I have fine art pictures on the wall versus portraits and weddings, because I kind of cut my teeth on wedding photography, weddings and portraits. But I spend a lot of time doing high end commercial photography and portrait work and all that. So I've done a little bit of everything. I was even talking earlier about, I did some hip surgeries one time and brain surgeries and open heart surgeries, just random jobs that I got that were fascinating things to do as a photographer. So I recommend uh, for sure taking whatever you can get sometimes <laughs> for the experience. Uh, and upstairs we have a little meeting area and mostly wedding things up there because that's kind of what we sell. Little workspaces down the hall. This is our conference room. We show slideshows and have wedding images in there because that's mostly the wedding clients come in there. Um, I did, after many years of um, photographing professionally, I got into teaching. And some of you might have uh, heard about my Photoshop actions that we've done for many, many years. But really teaching became a big passion of mine. And I got somehow sucked into writing a book a few, <laughs> not too long ago. And it was one of the biggest uh, projects I've taken on. It took over a year to, about to complete this thing. I've been a commercial photographer for years. And I have all kinds of giant, big lighting equipment stuff. But 90% of the time when I go out to shoot, I want to just bring speed lights. I want to have everything in one bag if I can, maybe a little extra side bag of backup stuff. But if you can do amazing work out of one bag with two or three of these speed lights, I think it lowers the entry to everybody doing better work. Because I find that that's one thing that most photographers who are new to it are intimidated by these little lights and how to operate them. And that's kind of what I want to do is to break down that intimidation factor and show you how you can get great stuff with one, two lights. And just knowing how to work them and how to use them and blend it with your ambient light is the key factor, okay? Uh, this is for a band, a little rock band shoot. And uh, again, mostly speed lights, although I'll show you behind the scenes on this that there were some other um, lights in use. Here's kind of a behind the scenes to give you an idea of what the setup would look like. So speed lights here, speed lights there, speed light clamped the shooting across to him there. Um, these are mono lights, mono lights, um, all triggered with just radio slaves. But that's about as complicated as it gets for me as far as scenes. And I'll talk a little bit about how to set up a complicated scene. But what we're going to work on something simpler today, of course. Uh, we don't have that kind of a setup. This is a fun, uh, Craig, this is Craig Strong, the inventor of the lens baby. You guys heard of the lens baby? Do they have them here? Everybody's got the, or probably has heard of them by now, but this is one of his, his uh, iterations of the lens baby. So I did a portrait of him, and he's really a, quite the mad scientist. So that was my idea, was to do a, a mad scientist, kind of an image of him. 
little behind the scenes, my assistant and I are setting it up. We used a, a ring light for the main light, which is why you have that cool uh, reflection in his glasses right here, and, and I can shoot so close with that ring light. And then speed lights everywhere. There's speed light underneath here, lighting up the bowl, which we're gonna put some dry ice into there. Um, speed lights up here, speed lights there, all just kind of aiming at certain parts that I want to illuminate. So they're kind of controlled and gelled and all that, which we'll talk about in a little bit, how to do all that. This was a shot out. Uh, we did a little ninja fantasy anime shoot out in the forest one night. And um, several lights in this one. I'll show you a little behind the scenes in this too. Speed lights there. There's a speed light in the tree, which you'll see. Speed light inside the lantern with a warm gel. Speed light behind the smoke machine. Um, speed light up here with a grid spot aiming down there. So mostly speed lights. I think I had, ran out of speed lights and I had to add one, maybe one or two more of my mono lights to make that happen. There's a speed light on the tree. Grillapod, this is a great, uh, great accessory to have if you don't have one of these. Um, kind of designed for holding little cameras, but I find them ops, ops, awesome for flashes. Whether you're gonna cling it to something like a tree and aim it or just put it on the ground or on a chair right here. We could just stick it on this chair and you know, there's my light stand and shoot a speed light back to somebody, which we'll, we'll play with that a little bit later too. If you can borrow extra lights, maybe rent some for the day and challenge yourself to go out there and do a complicated scene with multiple lights because you learn so much. That's, I often get portfolio images when I just put myself out to do a personal project. So I'm gonna take 10 lights out and go and see what I can do with them. Um, and you, it doesn't have to be you know, for a job, it could just be a personal project, but you're gonna learn a ton from it. All right, so let's, talk, let's start talking about the light. And one of the first things that I want to I want to beat into your heads, or, sh or s massage, I'm sorry, massage into your heads, is that lighting is just as much about shadows, more so maybe, as it is about light. What the big mistake that most beginners make, what I made when I was starting out, was I just thought that you just throw a bunch of light on it and that's lighting. You know, like a, a photo should be just lit. You know, maybe there's like perfectly even, one on each side, kind of uh, two umbrellas here, one behind the camera, whatever. And if it had a lot of light on it, it was well lit. And yes, that means it's lit, but it doesn't have lighting, it doesn't have depth, doesn't have passion to it. This image here was shot in the middle of the bright day, but I use a little trick, which I'll share with you guys as well, as a neutral density filter. Um, which is something that I've been teaching for a while here. Most people have heard of neutral density filters, but they don't really use them for flash photography. They use them for to slow down water and landscape. You know, that's what they're typically used for. But I've discovered by using my ND filter with flash, I can actually achieve things that I can't with a normal high-speed sync um, of, a, of a flash. Because I wanted to shoot this at wide aperture, f1.4, to get this very painterly soft background. I also needed to darken down my ambient light, probably a stop, a stop and a half, to get it dramatic and not look like this, you know, like blown out, which it typically is here. So I had to do two things. I had to shoot wide aperture, and I had to have a very uh, dark background. And so what would that mean typically? Right, your shutter speed has to go 4,000, 8,000 maybe. If you want to shoot at 1.4, right? And it's pretty bright outside. Well, what happens to your flash? Hmm, we'll talk about that a little bit. All right, here's rule number one. So we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about a few things in the class. We're gonna talk about some basic essential lighting rules. We're gonna talk about lighting tools, and then we're gonna start shooting. So one of my first rules is distance dimin diminishes dimensionality. And what that means is simply this, that the closer a light source is, the softer the more it wraps your subject, the more it hugs and loves and creates smooth shadows. The further it is, the harsher the shadows. May I, uh, here, question about the sun. Is the sun a harsh light or a soft light? Harsh. It's harsh, right? Why? Because it's like a jillion miles away. It's huge, but what if the sun were to come right up next to the earth, boom, it didn't fry us all initially, then what is the sun? If the sun's right up next to the earth, it is the most soft, wrapping, shadowless light you've ever seen. It will be the giant softbox because it's humongous compared to the size of the earth or the size of the people on the earth that it's lighting. 
And as soon as that sun moves far away, it now becomes that harsh sun that we know, right? So that same light source can be harsh or very soft, just depending on how close it is to the subject and its relative size. And that's something that I think a lot of people forget because they think, well, I've got a soft box. Say I've got this. It's called a soft box, so it should be soft, right? And then they place it about 30 feet from their subject, and it's not very soft. And they're wondering why. I put it in a soft box, but the light's not soft because it still needs to be closer to your subject, to be softer. We'll, see, we'll show examples of that, too. So here's a real simple example, uh, firing through a disk. And this is um, about four feet away through a fairly large diffuse surface. This is about a 36 inch, about 40 inch disk, which is what my Luna Grip is based off of. 40 inch disk, so that's essentially a 40 inch softbox, which should be really, really soft, right? But look, at four feet away, it's not that soft. The shadow transitions are quick. This is how you tell a harsh light is that it goes from highlight to shadow very quickly. All right, But if we bring that same light source, adjusting the power appropriately to one foot away, look at the difference now. That by itself could be a solo portrait light. You don't really need any fill or anything. That's beautiful by itself. Same light source, same everything. One foot away is now gorgeous, soft transitions to the shadows. We still have shadows, because that's important. We're not afraid of shadows. We just want them to be soft, <coughs> three-dimensional. <coughs> Has anybody here taken art classes, like uh, life drawing or painting classes like that? No? Has anyone gone to school at all here? <laughs> one guy in the back. OK, good. OK, right. Well, in your basic art classes, one of the things they have you do is look at like an orange or an apple, you know, and you light it. And what you want to create is three-dimensionality, right? So to create three-dimensionality, you need that shadows to wrap and softly um, envelop your model. And that's going to be a face. or a Whatever, you know, whatever you're lighting. OK, so here's my other, my other clue for you guys. And this technique is called from ear to hear. From ear to hear. And this is, a, this is a simple trick to help you get the most out of one light. So let's say this is your light source. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get volunteers for this one. I'm not going to well, shoot. I'm just going to show you. So here's my camera. All right, we're going to. You can be my volunteer. We're going to light her. Okay, so you're my subject. You can come just hold this for me. And what I want to do is say, if I'm the photographer and I'm here, I want this to be along the cone of my lens. So imagine your lens is a cone, right? So I'll put it down for a sec, bud. Right? If you have a telephoto, you've got a tight cone. If you've got a wide angle, you've got a wide cone. Put the light source along the edge of your cone. So as it goes in and out, you just follow it. So when I'm behind the camera, you put your, the face of your light source along the cone of my lens. So if I had a wide angle, he'd be bringing it out like this. As I get more telephoto, he brings it in like this. So if I'm looking through my lens at the light, I should just see a sliver. Does that make sense? I should just see a little slice. If I'm seeing like this, the whole surface, then it's not along the cone. If I'm seeing the back of it, it's not along the cone. I should just see a slice of that light source. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is we start roughly at her ear and come towards here. Here meaning me. Okay? So photographing her, I've got this along my cone. I'll bring it right to her ear, and I want to come towards here or me. So right about there would give me a beautiful light that wraps as much as it can from one light source, because we're not putting it, say if I put this, typically if you put it like this, so she's at the center of the light, but that's no good. You're only using half of your light. The other half of it's going wrapping behind her head, and unless you know, she's doing selfies from behind her head, that's not gonna help me. I want the light to wrap. I don't wanna even have to have a fill light or a reflector over here. I wanna just use one light. And the way to get the most out of one light is have it wrap from ear to here and along the cone of your lens, which kind of what this illustrates in this, this crude drawing here. You can tell I didn't go to art class. OK, make sense? OK, we'll play with that as we start shooting, too. All right. Next, follow your nose. And follow your nose is a technique to remember when you're primarily photographing with direct 
harsh, maybe a grid spot uh, type of light. Because that can be really cool. It can be very fashionable. It can be very dramatic. I'm not saying it always has to be big, soft light. Sometimes we want very crisp, dramatic light. But you need to follow your nose, follow your model's nose, your subject's nose. So if you look at this uh, young lady here, this is a senior portrait. My light source, my primary light source is a grid, a grid spot, which is the rogue grid, which we'll use here, covering the front of my speed light. That narrows my beam, actually makes a tighter beam, more like a spotlight, aiming right at her face. I had another one of the same setup back here to create this edge light. Notice this little separation light, the nice little highlight along her arm and her hair. That's really important because that creates that separation from the dark background. And this is one of the things that I want you guys to take home with you guys today is that simply by adding one more light as an edge light, a hair light, a separation light, you can create a whole other level in your imagery. And it's simple. You don't even have to, this could be off by a stop under, a stop over, and you still will kind of work because it's just an edge light. The main light needs to be right on, but the background light doesn't need to be even that accurate sometimes to actually work as a nice separation and as drama. Has anybody here watch movies? Anybody? <laughs> that was a loaded question. Come on, work with me, guys. Yes, we all watch movies, right? OK, so you ever noticed in movies the, the heroine, the drama, the star, She's got soft light, and she's always got a little hair light behind her glowing her. She could be in the bathroom. She'd be in the closet. You know, She's like digging in the closet, and there's this beautiful hair light glowing behind her. It's like wherever she is, the, the main star, she's got this cool, beautiful hair light, backlight. Watch when you, when you watch movies nowadays. Uh, and notice how often you'll see that cool little backlight because it adds so much drama and separation, and it makes them look more glamorous. So that's one thing we can easily add to any portrait. Now, let's talk about candle power. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because most people don't totally understand the relationship between your f-stop and your flash power. So let's put it in black and white. Let's pretend that one flash unit gives you an exposure of f4. This is a random number, because one flash doesn't necessarily give one f4, right? But let's just say one flash is f4. I add one more flash, boom. So I get one more f-stop, right? F5, 6. So I add one more flash. What do I get? You went to school. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. You're right, 6.7. Why is that? That seems weird, right, for some of us? Because in reality, to get just one f-stop, no matter where you're at, just one f-stop, you have to double whatever you already had. Or the opposite. Or if you want one less f-stop, you have to take half. And that becomes important because when you start putting flash units, this one of the things that I have here, this is a triple flash uh, adapter where I can put three speed lights into a box. Because sometimes I'm outside shooting in the full sun, and I want to use a soft box. One speed light may not quite cut it. You got to add another one. So I had one more speed light. I've now given myself one extra f-stop. But what if I needed two f-stops more? I've got to put four speed lights, not three. And so even that wouldn't be quite there enough. So it becomes exponentially harder. And that's the main thing I want you guys to just keep, a, keep tabs on in your brain. Because when we start adjusting speed lights, a lot of times I'll have my assistants. I'll say, OK, I've got two speed lights going on. And I need one more. They're at half power each. And I need one more stop. If I had one speed light, it was at half power, but I needed one more stop, what would, I, what would I do to the speed light? Go to full. I have two speed lights, and they're at half, and I need one more stop. What do I need to do to both of them? Both need to go to full. Not just one to full. Both need to go to full. OK? Make sense? All right. So this, is, gets, this gets crazy. Like, so if I'm at F4 with these four, and I'm saying, oh, I need two more stops, F8. I actually need this many <laughs> speed lines to give me F8, and that's kind of crazy. So there are ways to work around that, and that's uh, using a neutral density filter, which we'll talk a little bit more about. 
um, playing with your ISO and you know, controlling a lot of other things. OK, so let's talk about some tools. Cool tools you can use. I've used um, almost every different type of um, trigger. And there are a couple that I really like. The Pocket Wizards I love and these Yong Nyo uh, are very inexpensive and they actually work pretty good. Um, I know a lot of people are using those now because they're very affordable and they've got easy to use control right here. Um, what you need to decide before you invest in these is the importance of whether you're going to be shooting them just manual, which is typically what I do. Um, I don't shoot TTL with the flashes unless I'm shooting weddings and on the fly kind of stuff. Um, but typically I'm shooting manually, in which case the basic plus three or the basic Yong Nyo would work fine. But if you want any kind of TTL or wireless power control, which is something that I really want, uh, you need to have something like this or this Pocket Wizard set up to be able to control the power of the flash remotely, which is really important if you're especially working by yourself or just maybe one assistant that's not very experienced. Okay? And then, of course, high-speed sync. If you're going to be shooting outside, blending flash with existing light, you need a trigger system that's, that's capable with high-speed high speed sync. And these are, and these are, this one is not. But it's a lot cheaper, so you got to decide what you're going to do with it. All right, here's another one of my, my favorite tools. These are sticky filters. And sticky filters are basically stick-on colored gels for your speed light. So say you've got a speed light. And we need to make this thing, uh oh. Match the color of, say, tungsten light. Uh, I just got a question about this on my blog the other week. This guy was asking about shooting weddings. And the problem that he had was, he said, I, f I photograph weddings, and I want to preserve the warmth of the candlelight and all that. And then I throw my flash on because it's too dark. And then I have this bright white bluish flash compared to this warm candlelight. And they don't mix. And it just doesn't look right. And well, the key, key to that is to take a filter and put it on your flash. All right, so, a lot of us know that. These are amazing because they're sticky filters. They just peel off, and they're like a Post-it note, and they stick right on. You can reuse them, and it colors the flash now to match candlelight. Nikon has their own. Canon has their own um, little clip-ons as well. They just do the same thing. The reason I like these, I, I use both of them interchangeably, but these are nice because they'll go on anything. I can put this on a flashlight. I use flashlights sometimes for lighting. I can put this on just about any type of light, even the generic brand lights if I don't have a a fitted one for it. Um, and I've also got different colors, like blue. Sometimes I want to mix and create the evening light, and I can put a bluer light on there as well. And there's fluorescent gels. So another one of my favorite. I've been using these for years, and they're awesome. Um, good to have in your bag. Talked about the Gorillapod. I use that for holding a flash, clamping it to things, putting it on the ground. This is that little kicker light we talked about. And I use it with, um, there's a little mini ball head that I bought. This is a Cullman. It's a miniature one. And this is actually nice because it's pretty solid for a small. Um, and that lets you lock this down in any angle you want. It just screws right onto your Gorilla Pod. And then there's, this is called a Frio shoe. And this lets you just mount your, but you can also use the plates. There's little footies that come with your flash unit sometimes that screw on. Um, the Frio one is just a nice because it fits any flash and it has a little quick release locks it like that. Okay, So this is a nice little gadget to have in your camera bag as well. Um, be able to mount your flash anywhere you want. Okay, These are things that are essential in my bag. There's a little close up of those two little gadgets and what they are. Now when we need to add power, we talked about the triple threat. That's from Westcott, this little three flash adapter. And this could also be used by itself. It has a typical a uh, threaded mount for a light stand. It's got the quarter 20, 3 8 inch. You can put that around a light stand, and boom, you've got your triple light. Or you can decrease the recycle time by a booster battery. This is the Impact Booster. I've used this one, and this is amazing because I can get full power flashes recycled in one second. From, you can power two flashes, and in one second, you have full power recycle. So if you're shooting fashion or quick moving subjects, if you ever find yourself waiting, your flash does, not recycling fast enough, uh, this is a, it's an awesome accessory to have. 
this is a typical use for those uh, tools here. We did a little engagement session, and a lot of times I like to set up uh, themes in my shoots. So I'm shooting engagement sessions. So I set up a theme with this couple. Um, after meeting them and figuring out what they're into, I said, hey, you guys are kind of vintage style, and uh, why don't we do a, a story like you guys are running away from home and the car breaks down, you, you, you know, you, you're back in the day when there's forbidden love and you guys couldn't get married. So you run off together, the car breaks down, you don't care, you get out of the truck, you drive away and keep on going. And so we made this whole little story in our heads, you know, and that, that gets the client into it. That gets them engaged and involved. Anybody here shooting portraiture, think about how much more your client's gonna wanna buy those photos if they were part of a process like this of creating a love story or a family story or a whatever it is story versus just saying, hey, come to my studio, sit down and I'll take your picture. Yeah, duh, it looks like a million other photographers in town could do that. But if you sit down and create something really unique and special for them, there's no way they're not gonna buy a ton of these images or an album, really, from an engagement session. Normally it doesn't happen in an album, but this kind of thing, it does. So the lighting behind this was it was full sun, and you can see the sun on their shoulders, putting that nice little edge light. You can see their shadows cast by the sun. But I needed to fill to have light on their faces because they're coming towards me. I had them purposely facing. I picked a spot on the road where they would be backlit by the sun. So my sun is my backlight. My main light, I'm going to use uh, this another shot from the same. There's a triple threat with three speed lights just bare. That's it. And they were balanced so that they balanced with the sun, gave me enough fill to, to match the, the sun. And my assistant, being because it's mobile, we just use a pole a lot of the times rather than a light stand. Uh, we just ran with the couple as they ran towards me. So I had the couple run up the street towards me, and the assistant would just run, kind of keep the same distance with that light, and I could fire it off pretty darn quick as they came up the road. Uh, if you don't need TTL control, you don't need automatic control, you just want to trigger multiple flashes, get a splitter, and depending on which kind of uh, trigger you're using, you can use just like a headphone splitter. You know those, like if you go to the mobile store and get a headphone for sharing earphones with somebody, that'll actually split a pocket wizard signal. So I have one pocket wizard and I've got a, two headphone splitters on it, splitting the signal to three, three flashes. So a lot of people are like, well, I need to have a trigger for each flash. That gets expensive. You know, well, if you, get, if you want to just adjust the flashes manually, which I do a lot, you don't have to worry about automatic control. You can actually trigger a number of flashes from just one trigger, uh, as long as they're on the same, like they're all going to be in the same box or whatever. Okay? Even the, the young Yongnyol, they use a different type of wire. Um, but there, I bought this on, uh, online from B&H, too. There's a splitter for these as well, so it splits that same signal into two. So I can use these in that, in that mode as well. I need to save my triggers for something else, something more important. All right, so let's talk about the ND filter, because this is another little secret trick that if you guys get this and apply this, you'll be actually have a trick in your bag that most professional photographers don't even know. And I know this for a fact because I've taught professional photographers for the last 15 years, and most of them were like, huh? I never thought of using it for that, you know? So, uh, something good to kind of keep in your little bag of tricks. ND filter, I use the variable ND. This is a Singray, very ND. And the reason I like the variable is that it goes from two to six F stops, darker. And we'll, we'll go out today and use this. You can see, so basically I'm using that variable ND to control my ambient, but the question we had earlier, the ambient light to give me the exposure for the existing light that I want. And the cool thing is, the reason you, you might be thinking, well, why don't I just raise the shutter speed? Yeah, you can. But if you want to use flash outside and your shutter speed goes up to 4,000, you're now in high speed sync zone. You guys know what happens when high speed sync switches on? It strobes repeatedly faster than you can blink an eye. It may be firing off 20 times, 10 times. And if that flash actually takes two, three, four seconds to recycle full power, do you think you're getting full power in a blink of an eye? No. You're getting a fraction of the output that that flash is capable of whenever you go into high speed sync. A fraction, sometimes a tenth of the power that you can actually get. 
So high speed sync is cool, but it's not the most efficient when you go outside and you need a lot of light to balance with the sun or whatever. So that's what I discovered. My ND filter could actually give me a stop to almost two stops more. And I'll show you an example. So here I set up this little test shot. Just, this is just, just a test of the output to see how much difference is there really between a high speed sync and an ND filter. So, to get this blue sky, I had a speed light in a soft, like a small rapid box on the side over here. And my high speed sync, uh, my camera indicated I need 1 8,000. That's the maximum shutter speed my D800 or whatever it was I used was capable of. To give me this at the shallow aperture that I wanted to shoot at, I was pegging it at 1 8,000. And my flash was on full power. So high speed sync gave me a, a decent exposure. But if I was in any brighter situation, it wouldn't work. So then I took off the high speed sync and set it down to my magical sync speed, 1 250th. At 1 250th, with the ND filter, I was able to darken the sky the same amount, the ambient the same amount with the ND filter instead, keeping my flash sync speed at 250, flash at full power. Now I've got almost two stops more output on her face. So I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I always thought that high speed sync was the only way I could do this. Now you've got another option, okay? ND filter. Yeah. Is her face, in your opinion, not washed out more than that? It is, yeah. No, this is a good question because this is not to show you this is a better exposure. Oh, yes, sir. It's just to show you how much more power you get oh, with yes, ND filter versus high speed Thank sync. You. So, yeah, that's a good question because people look at that and go, that looks bad. <laughs> well, I don't want to do that. Yes, you're, this is a better exposure, but this just is there to show you the power. Possible. It's possible yes, to sir. get that much more out of it, OK? Thank you. At full power, same full power setting. All right, so here's, here is it in use, practical use. I wanted to, there's a window behind her. I wanted to get that brightly lit trees to be dark and luscious. So the only way to do that was to throw the ND filter, dial down the ambient, and then boom, just throw on my, my one little octa box right over here, like a rapid box. It's just off to the side here, about three foot octo. And then right behind her, you can see this nice little rim light, edge light, separation light. That's just the speed light on a gorilla pod clamped to another chair right behind her. So two lights, beautiful lighting. I was able to dial down my exposure to get um, the ambient light, the warm of the, uh, the um, lamps, and the background of the, with the ND filter. All right, so let's talk about the three lighting styles that we're going to, everything that you do pretty much falls into one of these categories. Big, soft window light. And for this, I use a scrim gym. This is a soft, about a three foot by five or six foot um, diffusion frame. These are classic in the commercial photographer's world. And I started using it for portrait photography years ago because it creates a beautiful window light. You can take it with you on location. Simple, beautiful, pretty much foolproof lighting. Like if you're a lighting dummy, put a speed light behind one of these things and you got it. You know, it doesn't have to be that accurate and it looks good, <laughs> which is kind of nice. But when you know how to use it, you can do amazing things. So that, boom, speed light behind a giant scrim by itself, nothing else makes gorgeous portrait light. Okay? The main thing to remember is to just adjust the zoom on your speed light so that you're covering as much of that scrim as possible without going too far beyond it. Um, you'll see on the ground here in this photo the spill of that. But the spill is OK as long as that's not in your shot. And it's not because I'm shooting into the background here. So I don't care about this spill, but I want to make sure that my flash is covering as much of this as possible so I get the softest, biggest window as possible, All right? Add a little fill if you want to. Less drama, but beautiful, beautiful fill. Now we can see lots of detail, and that's just one little reflector on the side. Super simple setup. You can take, this could be your one and only portrait setup if you want, and you can go to people's houses, you can go on location, you can do it in the studio, and it's gonna look great. There's by itself, and there's with a little bit of fill. Okay, some people like that better, and some people like that better. It just depends a lot of the mood you're going for. Alrighty, 
So we'll take that outside now. So here's a little fashion-y shoot outside. Where's the sun? Can you guys see the sun? You know where the sun is? Behind her. Yep. The sun's up in the sky here, peeking through the clouds on the left, creating this little rim light on her hair, this edge light on her shoulder. So the sun's one of my light sources, but not that big, soft, beautiful light on her face. That's not the sun. That's my schmang, my big scrim with two speed lights um, behind it right here, shooting through. So at this point, this picture was taken. The sun was coming in and out of the clouds. So the sun is hitting this and giving a little bit of bounce from the sun as well. But uh, most of the time, the sun was actually in the clouds, and there was just the speed lights lighting through this panel to create that soft look. That's still on the other side. The next picture, there's like one of the top right. Is that like still light? Or? This one here? Yeah. No, that's a microphone. We made a video. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dead cat micro fuzzy microphone there. But that is putting a little bit of fill light, I guess. The microphone probably reflects a little bit, yeah. Photographing children. Um, they're great. So this one we did inside of a store where they like to shop. Again, part of the story thing, right? I asked the mom, do the kids have a favorite place? Like a park, a playground, whatever. They go, oh, Lulu's Boutique or whatever. I'm like, oh, shopping. The girls love to shop, so let's go there. So we went down. I asked the owner, is there a good time I can come? We can do a photograph, and I'll let you have some photographs for marketing if you want, whatever. She's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Come at, you know, right when we open, we're slow. So that's what we planned, we went down there. And this is a, one thing I learned from writing my book, which I think is a great tip for any photographer. You can shoot in amazing places if you just ask. A lot of times we're just afraid to ask. We think you know, we have nothing to offer. You don't have to pay for a lot of places if you just say, I'll give you photos. People want to use the photos. They want to do marketing. They want to do websites, whatever. Um, and that's 99% of all the places, locations we shoot at, we don't pay anything, we just trade them photos, and they're more than happy to do that. And that's, that's a really good way to get some cool locations under your portfolio. So this was a store. We wanted it to be bright and, and um, airy. So one big panel, one big scrim, scrim gym type thing, and speed lights behind it. And there's also one little box like this right here. Okay, this size, exact size box up on a light stand way in the back to create the little hair light on them um, because the shop light was not quite enough. So that's kind of lighting all the stuff in their hair. And this is the main light, the window light. Uh, and that's our setup, two, two lights. All right, your second light type is the soft, shapely shadows. And this is the one we're really going to work with the most because I think this is the most versatile. It's also one of the most beautiful. Uh, it's easy to, easy to create um, soft light, more direct light. And three tools that I really love is the Luna Grip, which is this uh, gadget here. This is something that I created uh, for Westcott, with Westcott, uh, based on a handheld method of this that I used to do for weddings for years and years and years. I would hold my speed light, my assistant would, and hold the disc and try to get that thing perfect, you know, like this, to, to illuminate somebody or walk around the reception going like this and firing it through and get this beautiful softbox look. But it's like, oh, she's looking over here. The light's going there. <laughs> this thing's blowing in the wind. It's going all over. So I, I always said, there's got to be a way to marry these two together and hold that thing perfect. And boom, so we created the, the Luna Grip. These have been on the market a while, and they're fantastic tools as well. So it just depends on what you're looking for and what you want to use it for. Um, this, you put a single speed light behind it. This is called the Rapid Box. And there are different sizes on that, if you haven't seen these yet. So speed light mounts here, boom shoots through, and you've got a nice little Octo. Octo is one of my favorite types of boxes because of the natural round catch light it creates. It's beautiful. And this one right here, the Apollo, very similar but different. And the speed lights go inside the box, bouncing inside and then backwards out. So this one, you can put the triple threat inside here and actually get a really powerful um, light. And I think we'll maybe take that with us to the park, too, as long as with the Luna Grip and play with that. This is a two light setup in the studio. Maybe we could try one of these as well. This is just using two. Luna grips and a clamshell. Clamshells are great for beauty glamour light. We got that nice twinkly light. It kind of takes away the shadows. It just has a nice glow. If you have a model with a good, um, fairly perfect face, the clamshell works really well. If they're not that perfect, then the clamshell just kind of doesn't work. So um, you don't want to have somebody that's got weird growths coming out of their head and things like that. So this is two shots. So the way I shot this was this is the finished image. First shot was this. 
I wanted wide angle, but the light source needed to be close to give me this, the quality of light I wanted, but obviously I don't want the light source in the shot, so I shoot it twice. Stay, just hold real still, or you can use the tripod, shoot once, boom, like this. Tell my assistant, get out of there. Shoot the second shot, boom, like this. And then I've got a few steps in Photoshop that I can just layer those, auto-align them, and erase that box right out, and literally in 30 seconds, you've got the finished image. Really, really easy, but you have to know that you can do it and know how to shoot it to be able to get that result. But then you have something that's virtually impossible to get that quality of light that close to her and be out of the shot in a wide angle um, is kind of hard to do without knowing how to take that thing out of there, okay? A little senior shot with a fish eye. People say, you can't do portraits with a fish eye. Well, you can. Uh, keep, the, keep the subject in the center as much as possible so they don't distort. Then you give a really cool background to it. The main reason I put this one, I was to show you another one of my favorite little tools to have along is a uh, battery-powered leaf blower. <laughs> Gets the hair, you know, whatever you need that glamorous wind and you don't have any, well, you got your leaf blower. <laughs> my friend uh, Vicki Toffer, who was a kid and portrait photographer, told me this trick. She's in the studio with kids and she'll blow in the leaf blower and they start giggling and their hair is blowing and then, you know, the dog's ears are flapping in the wind and it just creates this great fun scene and you get the motion of the wind. So that's, I keep that in my truck the whole, all the time. And whenever I need somebody to liven up, I just blow them in the face with the leaf blower and they, they come to life. All right, the last style of lighting is our crisp and direct. We talked about using follow your nose for this particular style, okay? So for crisp and direct, like this shot here, uh, I use the Rogue Grid. This is another one, same situation. This was shot in the middle of the day for a lounge or a restaurant. They wanted kind of a loungy shot for their ad that would look like it was, you know, in the middle, in their evening time, and I didn't get in there in the evening time. So this was one direct following her nose grid spot. Here's how it was set up. My, my Gorilla Toad assistant climbing up and just holding the speed light with that grid spot pointing at her nose. So whenever the model would move, her job was simply just to follow her. So if the model turned her head this way, she followed her nose, followed her nose, followed her nose, and it didn't really matter where she went. Long as she, that's why I like, I like assistants rather than light stands most of the part, because assistants can move on the fly. They can change, you can experiment, you can follow, where the light stand is like, oh, we can move it here, angle, duh, duh, duh. Drives me crazy. Follow the nose means direct the light towards Yeah, so if she's pointing her nose that way, we just follow it, you know? So if you turn your head there, if you're looking up, I'll go up there, if you go there. So if you look that way, I'm gonna bring it this way. So generally, that the reason you want that is you don't want that with a harsh light. You don't want those dark cross shadows, right? You know, that looks really weird, or the vampire lighting coming up. Um, if you're following her nose, you're always gonna get pretty nice jawline shadows. It just tends to work. Every rule is made to be broken, but... Uh, how many assistants do you generally take? 32 assistants, generally. <laughs> no, it's a good question. I usually have one. Um, so, some of these I had two people in it because this was uh, shot for my book, and I had interns who just wanted to be there to help, and so I said, yeah, the more the merrier, come on and help. But generally I can do everything with just one assistant, and it's usually my wife or Alicia, who is the one on the 100 toes up there, um, is my trusty assistants. All right. Boom, let's go on to my essentials kit. So a lot of people say, just what, is, what do I need to get? What do I need to emulate what you're talking about? This is kind of that basic summary. I mean, there's more things you can add or take away, but if you want kind of a basic rundown, this is everything that I've talked about. Luna Grip, looks like this when it's set up. Rapid Box, okay. So anybody asks, what's the difference between using a rapid box and a Luna Grip? Well, the rapid box, they have larger ones, and it will give you a very similar look. Um, if you're concerned about the spill, uh, there was a, we talked about that a little earlier, there was an image where the light was spilling around the scrim. Remember that studio shot? If you're in a small space and you're worried about the spill bouncing off the walls or creating shadows or whatever, then something like the rapid box will be a little better because it will contain the light to just your subject. If you're not concerned about the spill, then the Luna Grip will be beautiful. It's a little more compact, easier to stick in the side of your camera bag. Gives you a few more options because it can use as a reflector because I can put the cover on it too, my silver or gold cover, um, clamp it, and then you have a perfect reflector holder to hold it perfectly flat, and then you can do the clamshell lighting and things like that. So you've got double use out of it. 
um, and it folds down nice and small. So this, this is a, again, I do have a book, there's an app, if you're interested, you can check that out. But let's, uh, let's start shooting. We have Rebecca. Come on up, Rebecca. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you, Nice Rebecca. to meet you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we've never met, so this magic trick you're gonna see, I've never met you, have I? No. See, I've never met her before, and watch, I'm gonna make her disappear. No. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about, first of all, we already talked about the ear to here, and I think we'll save our time and just kind of work on creating. Um, you're in a situation like this, okay? A classroom, not the most glamorous situation. This could happen in a wedding. Um, sometimes I go into these wedding halls and it's just, it's just ugly. You know, like, like, what am I going to do with this place right here? So how can we make something kind of interesting in a place that's really not what you typically would think of for a portrait place? All right, so I'm looking at this room right here, and I've got a couple of ideas just popping into my head. One would be um, to see if we can use some of that, all those, see those screens back there going on? There's some lights back there. Maybe we could, if I did something kind of a tight, had her down the aisle, photograph there, use the lights and the screens, maybe the people moving, um, and that ambient with a shallow depth of field might be kind of interesting. We could do a little clamshell lighting to do just a nice headshot of her. You know, with the two, we could use one of those and one of these, clamshell it. We could do a little dramatic kind of a Harelli style portrait. We could have her, you know, kicking it on some chairs or on the ground right here. See if we can come up with. Um, so there's, if you know how to use your lighting, you can kind of create something. It may not be the ideal thing, but the, the, the point that I wanted to share with you guys is you can create something almost anywhere. And that's what we're gonna need to try to do, okay? So let's try that. Why don't, I'll show you guys first of all the Luna Grip, how this thing sets up. So this comes in a little kit with uh, a handle, Inspector Clouseau handle here, and a bracket to hold your flash, and it's adjustable up, down, in and out, and whatever, so you can set it up for whatever size uh, flash and receiver you have, and it comes with your poles, which are shot corded, okay, and they just shake them out to assemble them. And then you have your disc, and what I do, a little tip for you guys, um, and Dave, this is a good tip for you too, if you tell people who are buying, I think we're sold out now, but back orders are coming in soon, right? Pretty soon. Pretty soon, okay. They might even have some stock here at B&H. Yeah, B&H may have them. Okay. So what I did is I take, you see these little marks? I, I figured out the equidistant around by just plugging this into the, the handle and laying it on here, and took a little Sharpie, like a silver or gold Sharpie, and marked on my disc, equidistant around. And that just makes it a little quicker for when I'm attaching it. And the way you attach it is these hooks are kind of cool. This is one part of our patented, this single thing's patented design, is it just hooks around and then it, it's locked on. But you have to bend it out to take it off easily and then just back on and it hooks on, okay? Then it's perfectly hooked, okay? So then we you might want to just put it on the ground. So that's why I have those little marks on there so I can easily hook it on. There's one, there's two, here's three and then we pop it into the handle. So one handle goes, one goes right here, one goes here, one goes here. You're good to go, okay? And then you put your flash in there. You don't need the uh, grid on that. And I'm using the Yang Nyo transceivers. Make sure everything's tightened down and then you're set. This does have a uh, quarter inch 20 thread on the bottom, so if you want to mount this to a little bendy bracket or a light stand, you can do that. It's a standard uh, quarter inch 20. Um, but primarily, we use this handheld. When we go out to the park, like I said, we're gonna be like gorilla shooting, we can't set up light stands, so we'll just have somebody hold this, and boom. All right, so let's do this first. Let's see if we can set up a shot down this hall. So I'm gonna grab my 85 millimeter, my camera, and the first thing I want to do, I'm going to turn the flash off, is I want to set an ambient exposure. Try to trip over everything here. Um, because you start with your ambient, right? And then you put in your flash when you're mixing the two. Now, if I didn't care about the ambient, I just wanted to darken this room down and just use the flash, then I'd set it to 250th of a second or higher and just use the flash, wouldn't need to worry about it. But I actually want to drag the shutter, get a little bit of that ambient so that we have something going on in the background there and see what it looks like, okay? So I'm gonna say, we'll go to manual exposure, turn off the auto ISO if you do use that, 
And I'm gonna set my focus kind of close here so I can get a, get a sense of what the background's gonna look like. Very dark. My ISO is at 100 right now. So that's, uh, I think you can see the setting, yeah, up there. ISO 100, F1.4, 15th of a second. I'm not sure that's even dark enough in the background. I don't want that darker. What do you guys think? It's pretty bright. It's kind of bright, right? So let's go, a stop would be what? 30th, right, because I was at a 15th. And wait for it. So there's one stop down. Now that that's focusing actually in the background. When they, when they wrong way shoot, it's going to focus on her. So that'll be actually more diffused. Uh, but I have I can't focus this close without something lighting it. And also this is applying a preset when this comes in here. So um, oh, we'll worry about that later. So what do you think? Darker on the background. So again, this is, a, this is one of those subjective things. Somebody might say, okay, that's a normal exposure. I want to keep that for the back in the background. Somebody may say, no, nah, we want a more dramatic, darker. Yes, no? Yes. Okay, we'll go one more stop down. Let's see if I can focus a little closer this time. Okay, so now we're at 1 60th of a second, F1.4, another stop down, and now it's more diffused. So that's kind of like what we're gonna get in the background. Why don't we start there, add her, and then, we'll, then we can compare the two and see what we're getting, okay? There we go. So two stops was about right, right? Mm -hmm. And now we've got, uh, do you know why I had him bring it up a little higher? Cheekbones, and also it took some of it off the background. Remember the image before? We had a little bit of too much light on the background, and I want to keep that background as dark as possible. So by having him bring it up a little more, it kind of just cast it down onto her. The reason I have her look up towards the light is to make sure she's following her nose, right? Remember, follow your nose. So now we have the beautiful cheekbone shadows, chin shadows, um, nice still catch light in her eyes, the light's facing her eyes, and we have something to work with. The background, we have these cool little lights in the back. Um, I have no, that's just the fluorescence back there. I don't really care what they are because they're out of focus. But now we have something that looks kind of like a Siddle City scene, right? In the middle of a really busy, ugly store. Okay, so let's work it some more. I mean, nice store. B and H is a beautiful, beautiful store. <laughs> so I've got a warm gel, sticky filter, plus the grid. So you should have a pretty tight beam. This is the the least tight of the beams, which I'm not sure, but I think because we're pretty pretty tight uh, perspective here, it's going to be fine. It's not going to spill. What power? Somebody said an eighth power would be a good starting point. I'm setting my trigger to channel B. Always channel A is my primary light, my main light. Channel B would be my second light, secondary light. Channel C would be if I had a third light somewhere else. I try to keep them separate, of course, so you can independently adjust the power on them. So let's see. So I'm going to go for. You already know. <laughs> <laughs> I want you guys to think it out. I mean, it's, that's the first of a class, is that you guys help to figure it, think, think things through too. <laughs> All right, so he wants to change to 16, so I'm going to. Let's do it. No. Okay, no, we won't. <laughs> uh oh. Silly screensavers. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you should have a trigger. There we go. And, okay, Rebecca, I think you were leaning this way just a little bit. Yeah, that way. That's good. And what if you, that, that's good. You know what to do. Okay, so I have them both at 132nd. So the main thing here was to get you guys to see that, creating that shot, which we were on the road to just adding that hair light. It's beautiful, something in the middle of a very ugly, ugly scene. So two lights would have made it even better. Outside, what we're gonna do then is to take the ambient light and we'll shoot it normally, adding some flash. We'll darken it up, we'll throw the ND filter on there and play with some of those tricks that we've been talking about earlier and you, kind of, you can see how we can create a variety of looks with pretty average light outside. All right guys, so we went outside. We first of all had to look for a spot, a good spot. So we looked for the buildings. These buildings uh, are very iconic. They're New York. That's what we wanted to set up the shots. So we find our spot and then we set up the light. So the first shot that we did, and you can see here, we looked for just the existing light. How do we want to set the ambient light? 
Um, we adjusted our shutter speeds so that we got that just about right. And then we want to check about well, how's this going to look with a little flash. We want to make it a little more dramatic. So we bring out the Luna Grip, set that up with the flash, uh, did some exposures with the flash, and then try to balance it with the ambient light. Then we changed up the lens a little bit. We did uh, the 50 millimeter f1.4, which is a beautiful lens, gives you a nice softening of the background. Um, and that 1.4 is really important to get that soft, soft depth of field and to make the shapes in the background sort of turn into um, abstracts. Okay? But then to shoot at f1.4, sometimes you need to use high speed sync to get that flash. So I'll use the high speed sync, and we used it a few times, and it worked really, really well. But looking at this scene too, now the sun's starting to peak above the uh, the building back there, and it looks like a really nice, like a hair light on the model. And so let's look about what it's going to look like with just the ambient light. And we'll use now the Luna Grip as a reflector holder, and just a soft white reflector holder. Put that in the front, turn the flashes off, and I'm going to overexpose about 1.7 stops, between 1.3 to 1.7, in order to flare the sun a little bit to kind of soften the whole color palette and make it look kind of vintage look to it. Now sometimes we want to make it more dramatic. So remember what we did? We took our white balance down to 2500K, basically giving us a fake white balance to make everything very, very blue, adjusted the exposure, and then I put a warm gel on the flash. And you can see that here when we add the warm gel, it makes the model look fairly normal, slightly warm, which is good, but makes the background really, really blue, very dramatic, makes it almost a nighttime scene, something completely different than what you see with the naked eye, which is a really, really cool trick to know. Um, and we can also do that with the wide angle. But when we use a wide angle, we need to do the two-shot disappearing light trick. We talked about that earlier in the class. And the two-shot disappearing light trick means you take two shots, one with your lighting person in the shot, that gives the light for the model, and then you take him out or her out and shoot one more shot. And then in Photoshop, we simply layer them to use auto align and make a quick little layer mask and wipe away that thing. It takes about 30 seconds. And you can see right here, here's the result of the two shot disappearing light trick. We also shot the same shot with no gel, so you can see the effect of the lighting with just the light, but not the, uh, the tungsten gel, which makes her very, very blue, but we still have nice lighting. Then we're gonna look for another scene, and we found this coffee table scene. We want to set up a little cafe, a uh, little story of her waiting for her boyfriend, her husband, or whatever, and shooting through people. So we set up some people in the foreground to shoot through them. Again, with the 1.4, blurs them out. They become a framing kind of a subject. And we shoot at first with natural light. It looks really, really nice, actually, with natural light. Play with our exposure a little bit to get a couple different variations. And then we also wanted to add in some flash, so we kept the exposure uh, about one and a half stops underexposed. We added the flash through the Luna Grip coming over the top. And we got a beautiful, looks like a sun peeking through the clouds, shining down on her, and kind of work that variation. Play with some different angles. Um, but basically, that same exposure gave us these variations on that shot. So the main thing is I want you guys to take away is to think about all the different options that you have with just a couple of light sources um, and a couple little tools, uh, especially a neutral density filter, a variable ND filter. Um, you can do amazing things when you know how to control and balance your flash and your ambient light. And with those tools in your pocket, you don't need a whole bunch. You just need one bag, and you can create great light just about anywhere. So that's it. Go make beautiful pictures. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.